Okay, let's get going. There's a lot going on this week. Um, yeah, Friday, I know there's something happening too um, in here. Uh, but <clears throat> a couple of other things. Um, by 7 o'clock on Thursday, um, it's not going to help any more to study. So um, you may as well go and listen to Dr. Coonan's talk. Um, and just as a bit of a lead into this, he's not opinionated in the least. You know, so not to mince words, the modern synthesis is gone, i.e., he knows how evolution works, um, which of course has to do with viruses and you know, all of that fun stuff. So um, that's what's happening on Thursday. Um, he'll also be giving the biology seminar at noon where he's going to talk about something completely different, which is CRISPR, which is genome engineering, and the basic sort of discovery of how that happened. And a lot of it had to do with analysis of sequences. Uh, and I think I was one of the first people to hear about this in 2006. It's a very recent kind of process which is going on there. So if for some reason you're doing something else on Thursday, um, Friday after the midterm, um, on Friday afternoon, um, Professor Ryan Mayle, who's a new faculty member, relatively new at OSU, has a horrible title for his seminar, Ideal Bioorthogonal Ligations. Huh? What the heck is that all about? Um, has to do with unnatural amino acids, and um, again, someone who is clearly very laid back, not egotistical at all, um, he was the first person to engineer the first self-sufficient unnatural organism um, here in 2001, as he says. Uh, but what he's doing right now is he's running the unnatural protein facility. Um, and basically what they do at the unnatural protein facility is to trick the ribosome into using amino acids that it otherwise would never be using, uh, which is really cool technology. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we move on through the rest of the lecture. So yeah, once your mind's blown from the exam, you can go and get your mind blown about this stuff as well. So with that, let's <clears throat> move on and talk about the rest of translation, a little bit about RNAs today. Uh, again, this is the last new material that will be on the exam on Friday. Wednesday will be a review. There'll be a couple of quick clicker questions at the beginning of class, after which you can all run away and go study or something. Um, so, <clears throat> however, we have to have ours first, and this is that <clears throat> editing by amino acyl tRNA synthetases is dependent on the sequence of the anticodons, structure of base pairs, structure of the amino acid be removed, structure of the amino acid is not edited, or all of the above because I couldn't think of another one to put up there. No, just kidding. And five. Zero. Um, I guess we <clears throat> talked about this enough because, yes, it is the structure of the <clears throat> amino acid which is going to be removed. That's the only one that fits into the editing site. So I guess we spent enough time talking about this. So this is good. We like that. Let's hope that all the questions on the exam end up like this. So, pardon? I should use that one for the exam? OK. I'll bear that in mind. Um, <clears throat> in normal translation of a single protein in eukaryotes or bacteria, the GTPase activity of how many different GTPases is used? 
Different is in sequence. So the, the, the question is here, how many different GTP aces? So it would be you know, a different sequence of that particular GTP ace. So of a different pro sequence, a different protein, et cetera. The same protein is used more than once, it counts as one. Okay, um, this one evidently I didn't do as good a job talking about. So most people have two, which is a decent guess, but not a very good one. So uh, one of the things that I, and again, the problem here is probably that you haven't had the chance to study that particular material yet. Um, the answer, in fact, is D. Yes, I will explain just a second here. <clears throat> but one of the great things about this is that most of the people who missed it, it's going to get normalized out anyway. So um, that will hopefully take care of it. But um, the reasoning behind this is here. Normal translation of a single protein, which has got to initiate, elongate, and terminate, needs the activity of IF2, which is the initiator tRNA GTPase, which then has to hydrolyze in order to release that initiator. EFG helps move the ribosome along. EFTU does exactly the same thing as IF2. When you start out at the beginning, as you're elongating, when it binds to make sure it's the right thing that's binding there. And then when you finally get to the end, you have one of the release factors, and it depends on you know, whether it's a bacteria or eukaryotic, that then has to hydrolyze GTP to get the whole thing to fall apart. So you need four different ones. Okay, so that yes, no, totally confused, <laughs> completely disagree. Uh, we can talk more about this um, later, and particularly online. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, are all of these initiation factors, et cetera, GTP aces? Yeah. Uh, and the answer is basically the only ones that I put up here. Oh, so, the right, the other ones that are GTP aces. IF1 is not a GTP ace. IF3 is not a GTP ace. Release factor 1 is not a GTP ace. Uh, but all of them in the figures will have a little box that says, GTP that goes to GDP. Oh. Just count the boxes. I know it's easy enough to say now, but uh, it's a great review and think about translation. So I should I put this one on the exam? Yeah. No. <laughs> no, yes, yes, no. Now it will be okay to put on the exam. <clears throat> okay, well, again, I'll think about it. <clears throat> so uh, I want to finish up with translation, and then we'll talk a little bit about protein folding and then a really tiny bit about really cool stuff that RNA does um, right at the end. <clears throat> so when you look at <coughs> RNAs, message RNAs that are being translated in eukaryotes, what you see, and this is literally seeing if you use an electron microscope, is that these structures are all looped. They're all with the 5 prime end right next to the 3 prime end. How do they get there? It's EIF4G, which forms a bridge between your cap-binding protein, EIF4E, 
and the poly A binding protein that's next to the tail. So why? Why would this be to advantage? First reason is you're protecting ends. And protection of ends is really, really critical. Hopefully that's a theme which is coming back again and again and again. Don't want the nasty exonucleases. There are a lot of them around. They'd love to chew stuff up if a free end is available. So putting the two of them together makes it a lot safer. The other thing is that once you're done doing translation, your ribosome goes all the way around, makes the protein, gets to the end. It now will dissociate from your messenger RNA, do the activity of that GTPase, but now it's right next to the cap structure, so it can bind again and go around again. So it's also more of an efficiency thing as well. Is once you have translation started here, it's easy to keep going around this whole cycle. So that's the main role of EIF4G here, one of those other eukaryotic initiation factors. This, of course, is different relative to bacteria because bacteria are transcribing and translating simultaneously. And that's just a real quick reminder and shout out, D2L discussions. Um, there are questions and answers. When people ask me questions on email, I will post those answers on the discussion list. I went through today, and either the statistics are really bad or nobody's looking at these things. There are about 10 people who viewed some of these questions. Um, and I suspect that there's more than 10 people who are interested in those answers. So I strongly recommend you go and take a look at the discussion um, groups, questions, and answers in D2L. And if you have any questions about how to find that, please email me, email me later. So <clears throat> one of the things we've talked about quite a bit, but again, kind of hammering also on that clicker question, uh, you need to have for any given protein four different GTPases for every amino acid that gets incorporated. There are going to be multiple rounds of hydrolysis of nucleotide triphosphates. Translation is the most energetically requiring process in the cell. Translation chews up huge amounts of nucleotide triphosphates. The GTPs, but also the ATPs in terms of putting the amino acids onto the tRNAs in the first place through the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. So because of that, you want to be very careful about regulating how much translation takes place, and that if you have an incorrect messenger RNA, you don't want to have it be translated, because if it's an incorrect messenger RNA, then it's not going to be making a proper protein. So we already talked about all of the things that have to happen in terms of processing before you get export. That's clearly one aspect of things. But then other problems can happen as well. So probably the main one has to do with broken messenger RNA. Um, there are a couple of ways of dealing with this. <clears throat> in terms of eukaryotes, we already talked about the 5' prime and 3' prime ends being interacting with each other. If you look at the nuclei, oh, sorry, the ribosomes on here. Oh, by the way, polysome, before somebody comes and asks me about this, polysome just means multiple ribosomes associated with your RNA. But having these two ends together makes this a much more stable structure. Um, on the other hand, if you have a messenger RNA in bacteria, that then has other problems that have to be dealt with. And so we'll talk briefly about what happens in bacteria and then go back to eukarya. The process in bacteria is called tmRNA. The protein that, actually the gene that codes for this is called SSRA. Now why is it called tmRNA? But basically because it's a combination of a tRNA and a messenger RNA. What happens if you have a broken mRNA, you get to here the 3' prime end of the messenger RNA before you hit stop codon. So you can't have release factors that associate. You can't have dissociation of the ribosome. This now completely blocks the ribosome. The ribosome can't do anything. And this protein here is wrong. So how do you bacteria deal with this? They have this tmRNA which, kind of like it sounds, um, is a combination of a tRNA with an alanine attached to it and a messenger RNA here. So what this does is it'll bind in the A side of the ribosome and basically say, hey, no, here's a new amino acid to attach. And then what happens is this tRNA will attach the alanine. 
then the mRNA part of the tmRNA binds to the ribosome and encodes for a couple more amino acids. And I like to think of these amino acids as the eat me tag, um, which say, hey, this protein here is clearly incomplete because it was made from a broken messenger RNA because it has this tag at the end. And that tag leads to the degradation of that protein. This messenger RNA um, is degraded as well. Sorry, the messenger RNA, which is, is lost here, um, that gets degraded. But most messenger RNAs in bacteria actually don't last for very long at all. And we'll talk more about that later on. But because when they're being transcribed, they're also being translated directly, you don't have to have them be as stable as you have to for eukaryotic messenger RNAs. So another thing also happens here at <coughs> stop codons or lacking stop codons. And this is due to incorporation of unnatural amino acids. So I mentioned this right at the beginning um, where the seminar, again, the chemistry seminar is happening on Friday. We'll talk about unnatural amino acids. But basically, this process of translation takes advantage of the fact that we have these three stop codons. UGA is just one of those stop codons. Um, and in a normal translation, what would happen here is you have a release factor associate here. This guy forms a peptide bind to water. Everything is released. Everything's happy. You go along and continue. However, if there is a specific secondary structure that forms in the RNA, secondary structure against this base pairing, which is going to happen in the RNA, that then can allow the association of a very special tRNA. And this particular special um, tRNA is selenocysteine tRNA. Selenocysteine is interesting because the tRNA starts with a serine that gets added to it, and then with an enzymatic change, this is a protein enzyme that changes this serine to selenocysteine. And I wanted to mention this again because, as I mentioned way back when we talked about the different amino acyl tRNA synthetases, some organisms don't have 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases, which is what you expect with 20 different amino acids. Those that have less will basically do the same thing here, put on the wrong amino acid, and then have a protein change that amino acid, a separate protein change that amino acid to the correct one. And so that's what happens here. Uh, this selenocysteine, turns out we needed, and I think about three enzymes in our bodies. Uh, most organisms do require very small amounts of selenium from the trace metals that we actually do have to have, very often they're present in the active site of a number of different proteins. That always gets incorporated through this whole process. So a stop codon that gets bound to by this specific tRNA that, of course, has an anticodon, which is going to match your stop codon, but also needs some extra secondary structure. Yes? Uh, so is this eukaryotes and bacteria then? Is that what you're leading to? So this process, the selenocysteine incorporation, um, here where you have stop codons, is very similar. Not actually identical. There are three different ways. But um, this is the main one, and it happens in bacteria and in eukaryotes. So the question here is about for tmRNA, is it always alanine that's attached to the tmRNA? The answer there is yes. And then sort of getting back to your question earlier, tmRNA is specific to bacteria. It's not present in eukarya. Yeah? With the errors that we're going over right now, what is the more harmful reason that we have to get rid of this? Because it's producing proteins that don't work or because it's taking up a whole lot of energy so it sounds like a great exam question. Um, so <laughs> the question here is basically uh, why is, we'll just say, ribosome recycling or getting rid of aberrant proteins so important? And which one is the more important one? And the answer there probably depends on who you ask. Um, so having a stalled ribosome, which is stuck, can't do anything, or having aberrant proteins probably actually depends on the cell and under the exact conditions it happens to be in. So if you're rapidly growing, probably having all those ribosomes is really critical. So you're going to have to have 
all of those ribosomes and you don't want them sitting on broken RNAs. If, on the other hand, it's a cell which is not un actively undergoing replication, uh, then you might have problems with these extra proteins. And as we talked briefly about before, some of protein precipitation, we'll talk more about that later today, that can lead to big problems. And the obvious problem is Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, et cetera. So denatured proteins. These denatured proteins, the protein is not complete. It's unlikely to fold properly, much more likely to aggregate. And aggregation can clearly lead to some disease phenotypes. So the answer is probably both, and it's going to depend on conditions. But it's, it's, sorry, I, I, maybe I don't understand the question, but it's likely to be one, one or the other. Right, of those two. Yeah, those are sort of the main reasons, as far as we know, as why these things would be happening. Again, why in biology? Always difficult questions to answer. And difficult questions to answer on Stedman's exams, too. Yes, I know. <clears throat> so I wanted to talk about a couple of other things. You know, weirdness, as far as translation is concerned. Um, this one has, again, to do with secondary structures which form in your messenger RNA. This particular one is it's called program frame shifting. This gets back to what we talked about, different open reading frames. You remember the open reading frame is starting with a start codon, and then every three nucleotides are going to code for one particular amino acid. Um, and if you change, starting instead of from one position to two or to three, that, of course, is going to change whatever amino acids you have happening after that. This <clears throat> is a process that happens in all retroviruses, including HIV. And that is that they make one protein. And then in a few cases, because of this secondary structure, it turns out the secondary structure can be different in different viruses, this then causes the ribosome to basically shift a nucleotide and then start translating in a different open reading frame. And so that's basically shown here. Here's a stretch of nucleotides. The actual nucleotides themselves are not important. But you see phenylalanine, leucine, glycine. You have a shift. You now go phenylalanine, leucine, arginine. And it turns out that this leads to a whole completely different protein and in this particular case also includes the reverse transcriptase. Um, so without this, the virus would be non-functional. So this frame shifting is absolutely critical. Turns out we do see it in a few non-viral proteins as well, but it's best understood in what's happening in these, these viral proteins. So it's a secondary structure which is leading to a change in translation. So we had that secondary structure that led to a change in translation with the selenocysteine. Now we have a secondary structure which is leading to a change in ribosome coding, in the frame which it's using, also known as frame shifting. Where else have we seen secondary structures like this that are important in messenger RNAs? Hairpins for termination of transcription in bacteria. So three possibilities here. Turns out there are lots of other ones as well, but these are the three that we've talked about so far. So getting back to some, oh, sorry. Are there also two nucleotide frame shifts, or is it one nucleotide frame Ah, so the question is, are there two nucleotide frame shifts, or just one nucleotide frame shifts? I don't know of any two nucleotide frame shifts. Um, there might be. What does happen, however, is you'll have forward frame shifts or reverse frame shifts. And so that's basically going to be the equivalent. So if you have a plus one going in one direction, um, that would be like a, a plus two would be like doing a minus one. Now, if that makes sense, hopefully it does. <laughs> uh, how, how common is this mechanism of frame shift for? for regular translation? Um, the, the answer to that is, oh, sorry, we're one too far ahead here. Um, it all depends on having this secondary structure in the RNA. So if you have a secondary structure like this in the RNA, Frame shifting is going to happen with a reasonable frequency. In the, in the case of these retroviruses, it's about 10% of the time. So if in your RNA sequence you've got one of these secondary structures, the ribosome comes across it, it will undergo these frame shifts. Right. And again, we'll talk way more about this in virology next term, um, for those of you who want to subject yourselves to my lecturing for another term. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> so that was you know, basically the you know, weirdness with secondary structures. Let's get back and basically sort of go to the eukaryotic equivalent of these tmRNAs. There are two different kinds of ways that you can get rid of the messenger RNA, which is coding for the wrong stuff, and also get rid of <coughs> the proteins which are, are there. So the first one has to do with splicing. So this is what's called nonsense mediated decay. We talked before a little bit, we talked about RNA export, that you have these exon junction complexes which bind to the RNA after two exons have joined. So it's a great way of saying, hey, splicing has actually taken place. So it's not just important for this particular splicing action, but it turns out if there's one of these which is still on your messenger RNA, when you hit a stop codon, that means there's likely to be a problem in that messenger RNA. Probably there's some kind of mutation that's happened there. Because when you get to a stop codon, the ribosome's going to slow down looking for those release factors. But if it's slowing down and there's still an exon junction complex on your messenger RNA, that's going to cause decapping of your messenger RNA. As soon as the cap is removed, what's the cap doing? It's protecting against the nasty exonucleases. That will chew in on your messenger RNA. <clears throat> and once you have chewing of the messenger RNA, that will cause the dissociation of the ribosome. And this messenger RNA, which clearly had a premature stop codon in it, is going to get degraded. Nonsense mediated decay because it's a nonsense codon. The three stop codons are known as the nonsense codons because they don't have a sense. They don't actually have an amino acid which they are coding for. So that deals with messenger RNAs that have a premature stop codon in them. Yeah? Yeah, so the endonuclease is part of this <coughs> decapping enzyme. So the decapping enzyme then leads to an endonuclease which chops in here. It's chopping up pieces of your RNA. So it's individual pieces. It's not at all, it looks like an exonuclease, but exonuclease is going to be cutting in one nucleotide at a time. So there also are exonucleases as well. Okay. There are exonucleases and endonucleases. Yeah. So it, again, this is, sorry, the, the, the question is it looks as if it's transitioning into the decapping enzyme. The exon junction complex is not the decapping enzyme. And these extra proteins that I'm not talking about because I'm not going to put them on exams um, are involved in this activity as well. Um, as unfortunately is true with almost all the things I talk about in this class is it's drastically oversimplified, even though it may not feel like it. So um, that's one example of that. So the other problem that a messenger RNA can have, particularly in eukaryotic cells, is that it doesn't have a stop codon. Or you have cleavage of your messenger RNA that happens too soon, before the stop codon happens, and a poly A tail gets added because of the activity of CSTF and <coughs> CSF. So what happens then is the ribosome will keep translating all the way into the poly A tail. Well, three A's stand for lysine. So what that means is you have a protein that is now going to end up with a whole bunch of lysines at the end of the protein, which it turns out is just like in the case of tmRNA is a signal that says, hey, this is a protein which is probably wrong. It should get chewed up, in this case, by proteases. The other thing which happens is that if you have a ribosome that comes all the way out to the very, very end of the messenger RNA, it run in, runs into some extra proteins. Again, the name of them are not critical, but that causes the ribosome to fall apart, but also stimulate the activity of the exosome. And we talked a little bit about the exosome before. Exosome is also present inside the nucleus chops up RNAs. Here, exosome chops up um, your RNAs as well. 
also has activities at the five prime end. So both of these are going to cause degradation. Your messenger RNA is going to get broken down, and your protein is going to be got, got broken down. This is your non-stop mediated decay, because there wasn't a stop codon, in contrast to the non-sense mediated decay, which is where you have a stop codon too soon. There are other ways that messenger RNAs get regulated, but these are the important ones that really connect directly to translation and what's going on in the translation process. Before we move on to talking about what happens after translation, just wanted to mention really briefly here, sorry, this uh, resolution here is pretty horrible. Um, but the basic message here is that almost all antibiotics, with some exceptions, but the vast majority of antibiotics are involved in blocking the ribosome. And that kind of makes sense because you, know, you need translation to make all the proteins also an energetically very important part of what's going on in the cell. So most of the antibiotics that have been found, and most of these have just been found because they work, they end up causing <coughs> death of particular organisms, uh, have to do with translation. One of the neat things about these antibiotics is since the ribosomes, made of RNA, um, are quite different between bacteria and eukarya. A lot of these compounds, if they're active against bacteria, are not going to be active against eukaryotic ribosomes, and of course vice versa. So um, it's a really nice way of <clears throat> blocking the activity and basically the life of either bacteria or eukarya just by blocking these different things. And I'm not going to go through all of them here, but basically people have found antibiotics that basically address every single aspect of translation that we've talked about so far. Block initiation, block binding, block elongation, et cetera. So it's a nice way of, of reviewing these kinds of things here. I'm not going through the individual antibiotics. That's important for medical microbiology classes. It's not critical for this class, so I won't ask you the questions about exactly different antibiotics on exams. <clears throat> so questions on translation and antibiotics. Um, so when people very slowly can use about the possible end of antibiotics, are they, are they running out of ways to attack the ribosomes, or how does that? So the question here has to do with antibiotics and antibiotic resistance in particular. Uh, the main problem has to do with our friend evolution. And that is whenever you put selective pressure on something, and the best selective pressure is death. Um, so if you have a way of escaping from that, and some particular mutants will be able to escape from that, then they will still be able to have activity even in the presence of some of these antibiotics. And so that's, that's the problem. It's not so much having to do with the ribosome per se. And as I mentioned, Previously, we actually have a really good idea of the exact structure of the ribosome now that we didn't have even as much as 10 years ago now. So people are trying to use that structure now to design new antibiotics, which will then work um, relative to these ribosomes. So if anything, people are trying to find new ones based on that structure. Yeah, question here, and then I'll get to you. Yes? Okay. Um, so back on the last decay, yeah. uh, you explained why it said endonuclease. Um, mm -hmm. Right, they're exonucleases as well. So there's both. Endo and exos. There's okay. Yeah. So to further answer his question, so for the most part of uh, DNA or RNA called plasma, just to be convenient, but they but they take a lot of energy. So it gets resistant to stuff, but the moment you take away that one particular thing that it's useful for blocking, it no longer tries to destroy it and in fact hurts the bacteria because it's taking all this energy to continue to produce the resistance. So what they do in this medical lab is often they will have like one particular antibiotic for six months, and so it triggers for everything that has resistance to that, and then they switch so that all the ones that were resistant to that probably are resistant to this one too, and then they keep switching to different ones instead of doing them all at once. Yeah. Well, well, we can talk more about that um, offline, I think. <laughs> so great. That's very, very true, and that's exactly the way to actually properly do this. One of the big problems is that um, agriculture doesn't do the same thing. True. <laughs> So, um, but that's a whole different story for another time. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about what happens after you have translation. 
most of the time after translation, you're going to have a happy protein, well, which will fold up into its appropriate structure, giving an appropriate. Oh, man, you're slow today. <laughs> so, uh, polypeptide made again, string of amino acids, come together with lots of non covalent interactions, all those weak interactions, giving you a particular structure. This process going from stretch of amino acids to your final protein is called protein folding. And it's something that we wish we knew because it's really easy to figure out sequences. It's very hard to figure out structures. And once we figure out structures, we have a much better idea how things function. So um, how does this actually work? And this process, again, as we know from looking at particular proteins, but we'd love to be able to predict how this works. And no one's been able to predict these things yet. So what seems to happen is you have secondary structure formation first, which is not terribly surprising. That's the hydrogen bonds that are formed between the backbone amino acids. And then the big question is how do you go from this secondary structure to your final tertiary structure? And for a lot of proteins, it goes through this step called the molten globule. Now, what's a molten globule? Um, basically, a molten globule is a protein that has secondary structure but not its final tertiary structure yet. And in fact, people can see these in looking with some interesting techniques that hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about right at the end of the class, um, is looking at these particular secondary structures. So here's an example where we have a molten globule on this side and the final tertiary structure right next to it. And what you'll notice here is that most of the secondary structures here are pretty similar. Molten globule, this one thing, this particular alpha helix hasn't quite completely formed yet. But they're, they're very, very similar to each other. Um, and this, again, most of your proteins are going to go through this kind of step. Again, most secondary structures. And then finally, sort of trying to wiggle all of these things together to get your final process. There are a couple of ways that you get this wiggling taking place. One of them, which is the easy way, and also in the translation animation that I showed last time, and that is that as the polypeptide is coming out of the ribosome, it folds into its final tertiary structure. And when you have termination of translation, again, this end gets hooked up to water, and you end up with your final protein. This is great. It's wonderful. Uh, it doesn't happen for the majority of proteins. Probably about 20% or so um, fold in this particular process. What seems to happen much more frequently is you have molten globules, just like we show, showed before, which kind of bounce around between different possible tertiary interactions, basically sort of trying to figure out which of those non-covalent interactions, the weak interactions, are going to give the final structure, usually giving you the most stable final structure. And very often what happens is you end up with some of the wrong structures. And those wrong structures usually are going to cause problems like precipitation, which can cause issues again for cells and then um, probably for things like Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's disease. So basically what the cell has evolved to do is they have these chaperones, which are just like chaperones that I'm going to want for my daughters in a couple of years, um, to prevent incorrect interactions. <laughs> That's what a chaperone is supposed to do, stop these wrong interactions that are supposed to be happening. So it's exactly what these protein chaperones are doing, is they're preventing the wrong interactions or stopping those wrong interactions from going too far, also an important thing that I want chaperones to be dealing with. <laughs> So um, that's basically what they're doing. They're stopping all these bad interactions before they end up getting completely broken up. <clears throat> so these were originally found in looking at assembly of different viruses. And if you think about viruses, they're these ginormous complexes. Um, lots of proteins have to come together exactly right in order to form the structure of a virus. And so these were the original mutants which were found that had problems with putting viruses together. Grow E. Grow E is growth of an E. coli virus. So if you have a mutation in this protein, the viruses can't assemble, which is probably good for 
the cell because the virus can't infect it, but it um, turns out to be problematic for everything else. And there's a classic case of how studying something that people think is totally wacko and bizarre makes no difference, like CRISPR that Dr. Koonin's going to be talking about on Thursday, uh, turn out to be absolutely critical for understanding the very fundamentals of how cells work, et cetera. Yeah? Yeah, so when I say the preventing the incorrect interactions, that's going to be the secondary structures interacting in the wrong way with each other. And so that's what we're trying to um, protect. The other chaperones are also known as heat shock proteins. The reason they're known as heat shock proteins is if you heat up a cell, then all of these proteins start to get expressed. And that's probably because if you heat up the cell, what happens is proteins start to flop around a little bit. They flop around a little bit too much. Again, they might end up in these incorrect interactions. So these heat shock proteins are probably involved in what's going on there. Turns out that GROW-E is also one of these heat shock proteins highly induced when you raise the temperature of an organism. <clears throat> so what does it look like these things are doing? How do they do this job? Uh, the GROW-E turns out to be two different proteins, GROW-EL and GROW-ES. So EL is large. Grow E large, grow E small, that's what EL and ES stand for. What they do is they will bind to an incorrectly or incompletely folded protein, hide it again from the wrong interactions, use ATP, shake it up, make sure the right thing happens, and your correctly folded protein comes out. Um, and it turns out, it gets, sounds like a really bizarre process, you know, using your you know, mixology process for getting the proteins to fold, but it does seem that that's actually pretty close to what's going on there, at least for the small enough proteins that can fit inside one of these. How something like this, GROW-E again, important for building really big virus structure, that's still actually not completely understood, um, how all of those things are working. But it's also an ATP-dependent process, and basically what seems to be important for ATP is uh, binding to different parts of this protein, releasing those, binding, releasing, binding, releasing, until you finally have the stable protein. Usually that's the proper one with the proper function that will then get released. Yeah? So is the GROW-E-S the entire, like, brown and red structure, or is it just that cap? So GROW-E-S, the small, GROW-E-small is the cap. GROW-E-L, which is the GROW-E-large, is this orange part down here. Okay, other questions on these, on these GROW-E's. Um, there are the other heat shock proteins that also have ATP hydrolysis that are also important for protein folding. And again, it seems to be binding to your unfolded protein. ATP hydrolysis causes a change in the structure. And then this reversible binding and unbinding, which allows you to get that final proper structure. So <clears throat> this is basically an overview of what's happening here. You have the correctly folded, those are the ones that are co-translationally folded, correctly folded with the help of a chaperone. And there's also this garbage disposal, which we've talked about a couple of times before, but I'll get into a little bit more detail in just a second. And then very, very few of the proteins. This is supposed to more or less resemble the amounts, so about a third are correctly folded here, a third correctly folded here, and about a third are still digested by the proteasome by this um, molecular garbage disposal. What does that look like? Um, this is a EM structure of that structure right here. Move this out of the way. Uh, has an internal structure, which is basically the garbage disposal, even looks like one. Um, has multiple proteases here, which will basically will chew up any protein. They're rather nonspecific that gets into the inside of this structure. The important thing is getting the proteins to the inside if they're unfolded or need to be degraded in some way. Unfolded proteins are actually directed here usually more or less immediately as they're you know, starting to aggregate. We also talked a little bit about ubiquitin modification. Ubiquitin modification is important for signaling, but it's also important for getting protein degradation to play, take place. How that happens, you have the ubiquitin, which binds to this regulatory subunit of the proteasome. 
and then feeds the protein into this garbage disposal. You have the individual amino acids. They come out. They get amino isolated, hooked up to tRNAs, and reused. The really important thing here is the ubiquitin, that ubiquitin binding, which leads to getting this protein to these regulatory subunits of the proteasome. S, again, just stands for the size having to do with centrifugation. As I mentioned before, some of these slides we've seen way back when we talked about covalent protein modification. There are lots of different things that happen with ubiquitination, but usually it's this polyubiquitination, ubiquitin hooked to ubiquitin hooked to ubiquitin, which leads to degradation in the proteasome. How do we get that? It's through E1, E2, and E3. Again, Dr. Singer's work talked about this before. Again, it's an activating enzyme which takes ubiquitin, hooks it up to itself, then gets transferred to this activated intermediate, which is E2. E3 is what binds to your target protein and says, hey, this is what needs to get ubiquitinated. And we talked about all of these things before. Um, that's that process. Yeah. So what, when did we talk about ubiquitination before? That was like way back when. It was on the first midterm, so I've forgotten by now. Sorry. <laughs> no, but yeah, what was related? It was in relation to covalent changes. So you remember we're talking about switches. We we're talking about phosphorylation, kinase phosphatases, um, and we talked about G proteins. And then we also talked about ubiquitin right after that. Yeah, in a dim, dark, distant process. Now, the way this course goes, it, it is, does seem like a long way away. So that's when we talked about it before. And so if, if you want to learn more about ubiquitination, how we talked about it before, go back and listen to the lecture, I think, four or five. There's a little bit more information on that. Um, but important here is that, again, this is mostly for the degradation. Turns out that you'll have degradation that takes place of very specific proteins at very specific times. And so we talked about this when we talked about replication control. CDC6, what happens to CDC6? It gets phosphorylated. What happens after it gets phosphorylated? It gets ubiquitinated. What happens after it gets ubiquitinated? It gets chewed up. And it gets chewed up, and that makes sure that you have only that one round of replication from one origin of replication before you start the next cell cycle. So that's very often you have ubiquitin for regulating proteins that can only be present at certain times in the cell cycle in particular. Yeah? So how does it know that it needs to be ubiquitated? Is this like the structure of the oh, <laughs> oh, great. Oh, and this is, so it was here, literally. It's on the next slide, and it's, not, it's just disappeared. So I don't know how this happened. But OK, so I'll just explain this and hand wave. Hopefully, some of you have your notes here. Um, but basically, how does it know? The question is, how does it know to be ubiquitated and get degraded? So there are lots of different ways. But the one we just talked about, the example of CDC6, is phosphorylation. So phosphorylation of that protein leads to a change in the structure of the protein. It can then associate with E3. And then E3 is binding to right next to E2, and it'll put a bunch of ubiquitins on it. So that's one way. There are other ways which are degradation signals that are blocked by another protein, which I think is one of the other figures that was on there that before it disappeared, just disappeared on my computer. I have no idea how this happened. Um, and so that process um, would be having some other kind of protein which is associated there that gets dissociated, maybe through phosphorylation, something else which is happening there. And in some cases, you actually even have um, a proteolysis, a specific proteolysis. There would be a domain which is bound to wherever that ubiquitination signal is. Um, that then gets removed, and then you end up with um, degradation. Um, how this ends up happening through the cell cycle, that's all for cell biology um, next term. Okay, so we've talked about now, pretty amazingly, uh, DNA replication, how we started this section for you know, this particular midterm, mostly concentrated on transcription, so how you start transcription, how you cap, elongate, and splice your messenger RNA, how it gets taken out of the nucleus. That then can sometimes get degraded, as we just talked about today. Um, protein synthesis can happen, and then those proteins end up getting folded. In some cases, they get broken down. And you finally have this protein here at the end. 
this is a great way to get an overview of what we've talked about for this particular midterm. So we've talked, I think, before about a number of people, how's a good place, a way to study, take this, blast it apart, put in all the proteins, what their names are, all the things they're doing. You probably need a sheet of paper like almost as big as this screen um, to do all of that. There are questions on this before we talk about something in 15 minutes that we should probably spend all term talking about. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't actually finished writing it yet. I have about 250 questions. I need to lower those down to 50. Oh, that's, what I, that's, that's what I do, by the way. So when I, when I put together questions for exams, I go through every lecture, write questions in every lecture. Some of them I include is, as uh, clicker questions. And the rest of them, then I decide which of those I want to use for the exam. It's useful. It is. That's <laughs> what I spent all weekend doing. You can just make it shorter. <laughs> for you. Just for me. Yeah. Make, my, make my life easier, which is, after all, the number one point of existence. OK, so let's talk about RNA. Um, and this, again, is going to be a very brief overview talking about RNA. We've mentioned a few of these things before, um, RNA world, what people think about. Um, we'll also think, talk a little bit about how ribozymes work. We've already talked about some ribozymes. And then, of course, the you know, most important thing ever um, are these viruses. Um, just briefly, and unfortunately, this is a couple of years old. I didn't have a chance to update this. Um, if you look at the human genome, and one of the groups that's been looking at the human genome is the so-called ENCODE group. Um, they have already found tens of thousands, actually should be up to 20,000 or so, small RNAs that are non-coding RNAs that are being made in the human genome. We don't know what 99% of these things are doing. But they're clearly made. We have a whole bunch of them. And again, what they're doing there is really unclear, which is great because it gives us researchers a whole bunch of stuff to work on um, for the next well, certainly foreseeable future. But let's talk a little bit about the RNA world. This is something that, again, we've mentioned before. Big Bang, 15 billion years ago or so, a bunch of boring stuff. And then uh, solar system form It's what we care about. Um, this process, about 5 billion years ago, that's pretty clear. That's about when that we had our sun and planets started to form, et cetera. Very soon thereafter, and this would actually probably be moved back a little bit. Um, there's evidence for life on Earth. And that's pretty amazing that it's you know, billions of years old. Although, you know, to some extent, maybe it makes sense, thinking of it from an anthropomorphic extent of view, you know, we're the product of 14 billion, uh, 4 billion years excuse me, of evolution, um, certainly starting out from these original building blocks. But a lot of people have been trying to think about how a lot of these things occurred, and including Eugene Kunin, who will be you know, talking on Thursday. So Francis Crick also thought about this a lot. And he thought, hmm, it would actually make sense if we had RNA that happened first. RNA came before proteins. RNA came before DNA, et cetera. Why is that? Well, that's because RNA can encode genetic information. It's a stretch of nucleotides. We know that already. We know that RNA can also have catalytic activity. We talked about that for self-splicing RNAs. And as we'll see in a couple of minutes, it turns out lots of different kinds of activity that RNA can have. So how do you come up with RNA? This is what's called prebiotic chemistry. And again, a big focus of what's going on in Niles Lehman's ha lab here at Port and State. Um, really gets to some really fundamental questions about where life came from or where life is elsewhere. So a lot of people are working on these kinds of things. So let's talk more about this whole idea of RNA. So RNA has this amazing property, or two really amazing properties. One, that RNA can basically code for RNA. So just because of complementary copies, you have to go through one, certainly intermediate, because you always have to have complements. But it can also catalyze its own um, activity. And so one of the definitions of life is a self-sustaining catalytic system that's possible of undergoing Darwinian evolution. And that's the main definition that NASA uses these days, is it's a self-catalyzing, self-replicating system which can undergo evolution. So how can that happen? Lots of people have lots of different ideas. Um, some people say metabolism came first. 
coupling of different reactions to each other. There's some interesting chemistry that happens on surfaces. But the really critical thing is this autocatalysis, that one molecule can catalyze making more of that same molecule. We don't have that yet. No one's actually found a RNA dependent RNA polymerase that can make more of itself. And that's sort of the holy grail for a lot of these early evolution origins of life people. However, there are lots of ribozymes that are around. We already talked about self-splicing introns. RNase-P is a RNase which cleaves tRNAs. And its active site is RNA. And of course, the ribosome is mostly RNA. So these are a number of different activities that RNA can have that are moving towards this sort of goal of thinking about life as we know it. There's a problem, however, with RNA. And that is that ribose is actually pretty unstable. Um, and anyone who's worked in a lab or tried to work with RNA knows that it's a real pain to work with because it falls apart all the time. If you think about early life, it was probably on a planet that was getting bombarded all the time, high irradiation, et cetera. So a number of people have come up with ideas on how this could potentially have happened, um, either hexose RNAs or in even some extreme cases a peptide nucleic acid, because it turns out the peptide bond is actually much more stable than phosphodiester bonds are. Now, how can you make this in a so-called prebiotic condition or prebiotic soup? Um, there's this wonderful image, I'll have to try and bring it next time, um, Campbell's prebiotic soup. If anybody's seen Campbell's prebiotic soup, but it's, it's great. It's got all the, um, these appropriate you know, carbons and nitrogens, et cetera, that's around there. Uh, but <clears throat> ribose is tough. It's really a challenge to make ribose under these kinds of prebiotic conditions. Um, polymerization, as we talked about way back when, right at the very beginning of the class, is that okay, going from monomers to polymers is energetically really, really hard to do. And so how can you do this under a system where you don't have and lots of nice coupled reactions as well. But if you can make RNA, RNA is awesome. Um, and partly because it doesn't just form base pairs, hairpin loop structures. It can form all kinds of three-stranded junctions, four-stranded junctions, this so-called pseudo-knot structure, et cetera. RNA is incredibly flexible in terms of all of the base pairing interactions that it can do. We already looked at this in terms of the tRNAs. The tRNAs make these wonderful structures that fold together. Um, turns out the ribosome has even more of these. And it's not just going to be base pairing among single molecules. You have multiple molecules, um, et cetera. And because of that, it can form very specific structures, which lead to very specific. Ah, much better, much, much better. So um, probably the best studied of these are the strunk structures, excuse me, which are important for some of the catalytic activities. And not surprisingly, a lot of the catalytic activities that people are interested in are RNA working on RNA. So we already looked at self-splicing introns, right? Self-splicing introns is a RNA sequence which can chop itself out and re-ligate what's left in the RNA. So it's the activity of RNA leading to changes in RNA. Another <coughs> very important kind of catalysis that takes place are endonucleases. And this is a specific, very small RNA. I think it's only about 40 nucleotides in length, which can bind to and base pair with RNAs and catalyze hydrolysis. Um, turns out this is really important for replication of this kind of like a virus. We won't get into too much details about what a viroid is versus a virus. Again, take my class next term. We'll talk more about that. But important here is this short RNA. And this short RNA can catalyze hydrolysis of other RNAs. But much more important here is that this particular RNA can do this reaction, can catalyze this reaction multiple times. And so that is why I have down here the self-splicing RNA is not really a ribozyme. A lot of people argue about this because Enzymes should be able to catalyze the same reaction again and again and again and again and again. A self-splicing ribozyme, a self-splicing intron can't do that. Once it spliced itself out, that's it. It's not going to undergo multiple rounds of catalysis. Whereas these 
Hammerhead ribozymes do that. It's a structure, and not surprisingly, if you look at the secondary structure, it actually does literally kind of look like a hammerhead, uh, which when caused this <coughs> nucleotide hydrolysis. Um, that was found in viruses, but it turns out you can actually design RNAs to do particular functions. Um, and so this is what's called in vitro selection, um, basically doing evolution in a test tube. How do you do that? This is the process here. You start with a whole bunch of DNA, because DNA is a heck of a lot easier to make than RNA. Um, but uh, lots and lots of different sequences. And it turns out you can make lots of different sequences. It's a chemical process. You may have a chance to talk about this right at the <clears throat> end of class. But uh, you can make lots of different DNAs with many, many, many different sequences. You can then transcribe all of these DNAs into different RNAs, because the RNA is what you're interested in. Now with these RNAs, now what you need to do is figure out which of these RNAs have the activity that you're looking for. So this particular case, what people are looking for is a kinase activity. And this kinase activity is taking the final phosphate from an ATP and hooking it up to an RNA. So that's what people were looking for in this particular experiment. Again, this is going to be lots of different things, just looking for particular different kinds of activities. There are going to be very, very few. And I say when it says rare here, this should be really, really, really rare um, RNA molecules that can actually put a phosphate group onto that particular RNA. Then you need to separate the really, really, really tiny needle in the really, really, really big haystack from everything else. And the way this is done is through a separate selection. In this case, you have material which will just bind to sulfur. Binds to sulfur. All of these other RNAs disappear. You only end up with the RNA which is bound to the sulfur. This is the end of the figure that they have in the textbook. That's not the end of the way people do these experiments. They'll now take, this is going to be a mixture of different RNAs. They'll go back, make DNA copies of them with reverse transcriptase, change all of those, select all of these for the ones that work, and go through this process multiple different times. What have people been able to do with this? Um, really pretty amazing. All of these things down here at the bottom are RNAs which have been selected through a process like this to have a particular activity. RNA polymerization, DNA polymerization, amino acylation, RNA alkylation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whole bunch of different activities which have been able to be found just from RNA and just from random mixtures of DNA, random mixtures of RNA. So how close are we? Um, unfortunately, the best RNA-dependent RNA polymerase can make 11 bases, which is great, except for the fact that the RNA polymerase that does that is 200 bases long. So how do you go from 11 to 200? That's a really interesting question that we don't have um, a good answer for. The other thing you need for biology as we know it is cells, right? Because all, all biology is dependent on cells. How do you make cells? You have to have something which separates your genetic material and your metabolism from the rest of the world. Um, that's really hard to make with RNA. So a lot of people are also interested in how compartmentalization can happen, um, organic, or somebody, what's his name? Sound familiar? Uh, has some really interesting ideas on how compartmentalization could happen um, in an inorganic form. And just to finish up, oh, well. Talk about recombination, which again was a nice image that has now completely disappeared. Again, for no apparent reason. Um, this is an image from an article by Niles Lehman, again here in the chemistry department, who has been looking at recombination between different short RNAs. And it turns out that recombination can take place with about 30 nucleotide RNAs. Well, 30 to 50 nucleotide RNAs are just about what can be made by 
these RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, which are just RNAs. And so you may not be able to make a whole replicase just by going one nucleotide at a time, but you may be able to mix and match different pieces from, interestingly enough, a self-splicing intron, which is where these were originally found in the first place. So we'll stop here, um, and that will be what's on the midterm. Review on Wednesday. Um, viruses created DNA, but we'll talk about that last time, or you can listen to Dr. Kuhn and talk about it.